But most people have forgotten about it. South Korea and Japan met in a two-leg final to determine which team would qualify for the 1986 World Cup. Here's Jung Yong-hwan scoring the first goal for South Korea. Lee Tae-ho made it 2-0 for the Koreans in the match held in Japan. Kimura Kazushi tried to bring Japan back with this goal. But try as they might, Japan simply couldn't catch up. Though this was the only goal of the second match, the Koreans dominated throughout and easily breezed to the World Cup that was South Korea's first since 1954. You know, one reason that we don't talk a lot about the 1986 World Cup qualification is probably because Japan didn't actually have a professional football league back in those days. It's kind of hard to believe from our present day, but the sport really wasn't all that developed in Asia back then. Things were even worse for Japan in 1990 when they struggled to make it out of the first qualification round. Here they went down at home 1-0 to North Korea. Now Japan was eventually able to equalize in that match. And in the end, Japan won on this play, which looked to me like an own goal. However, that wasn't enough. North Korea dominated Japan in the return match in North Korea. This match knocked Japan out of World Cup qualification altogether. This was an ignominious ending that clearly marked Japan's decline in football. Japan pushed hard to create the J-League right around this time. Now, I don't know if the two events were connected, though I do suspect that there was likely some sort of connection here. The J-League officially started in May 1993, which was not long before the final round of 1994 World Cup qualification. As fate would have it, Japan wound up in a pretty easy first round qualification group and breezed to the final round, conceding only two goals in eight matches. South Korea did them one better, conceding only a single time in its first round. Now, this final round of AFC qualification for the 1994 World Cup had the potential to create an international incident. As you probably already know, the 1994 World Cup was held in the United States, despite the fact that the United States did not have a top flight football league at the time. The incredible thing here though is that Iran, Iraq, and North Korea were all still in the running for the two AFC qualification spots. Right before qualification began, the New York Daily News reported that the World Cup organizing committee was probably secretly hoping that Japan, South Korea, or Saudi Arabia would qualify. There was, of course, a very real concern that the United States Department of State would not issue visas to players from the other three countries, let alone their fans. When you look back at it, the real bizarre thing about this qualification is that all of the matches took place in Doha, Qatar. It was all over the space of two weeks. So why Qatar? Well, you have to remember that Iraq and Iran had just fought a war against each other and that North and South Korea were still technically at war. Playing in their home countries really could have started an international incident. And so, the marathon of qualification turned into a two-week sprint. Japan faced Saudi Arabia in its first group match and immediately had problems scoring. Japan had issues centering the ball well. I mean, this really should have been a goal. However, the Japanese defense was able to hold tight against Saudi Arabia's attack. In the end, it was a board draw, no score. South Korea, in contrast, looked excellent in its first match against Iran. 
Asokju was fortunate to score after an awful mistake by Iranian keeper Bezad Golampur. This goal by Go Jong Un was simply beautiful. South Korea got a deserved victory here. And so, after the first round of games, both North and South Korea found themselves on top of the group. As bad as things were looking for Japan after that draw, they soon got a lot worse. Iran wasted no time overcoming that big loss to South Korea, going up 1-0 on this corner. And what happened to Japan's defenses here? Now Japan did score a consolation goal at the end, but lost 2-1. Meanwhile, Lyth Hussein put Iraq on top against South Korea 1-0. Minutes later, however, Kim Pan-gun scored the equalizer. And then came this awful high kick to the face, a clear penalty. The replay shows just how severe this one was. Hong Myung Bo scored the penalty to put South Korea ahead 2 to 1. Iraq was able to score an equalizer with just a few minutes remaining, however. I think this goal probably should have been ruled offside. And so South Korea led the group after two games, and Japan seemed to be in need of a miracle. North Korea was Japan's next opponent in front of a ridiculously small crowd of 3,000. Miura Kazuyoshi put Japan on top early in this one. This marked the first time Japan had led in the entire final round. This was a huge contrast from beating up on Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. Nakayama Masashi scored to start the second half to make it 2-0 Japan. And then Miura managed to score again, putting Japan up by three. Japan's 3-0 victory was helpful, but would it be enough? South Korea, meanwhile, were deep in a scoreless draw with Saudi Arabia when Shin Hong-gi managed to score this one. In the 90th minute, however, Ahmed Jamil Madani pulled through with this equalizer. This dramatic ending had fans rushing on the field to congratulate the Saudis. Saudi Arabia and South Korea have remained on top of the table, but the big win helped Japan advance considerably. You probably know that the 1994 World Cup proper was the first time in the history of the World Cup that the winners in the group stages would earn three points for a match instead of two. The qualification, however, still used that old two points for a win rule. And that rule wound up having a considerable impact in the end, as you'll see. Japan and South Korea faced off in a match that Japan simply had to win. It was Miura with another goal to put Japan up 1-0 around halfway through the second half. No matter how hard they tried, the South Koreans simply couldn't get it together this time around. Japan's defense was solid. And the clash of rivals ended with a 1-0 victory for Japan. That second victory meant that Japan wound up moving to the top of the group with five points. Notice, of course, that Iran were down in fifth despite winning twice. That's where the two points for a win rule becomes important. If they had played with three points for a win instead, Japan would have clearly been on top of the group, but Iran would have been closer in the hunt. I know that this sort of counterfactual argument doesn't really matter, but it's still really interesting to think about. Things have really changed a lot over the last few decades. Though North Korea was no longer a threat to qualify, Iran and Iraq were still in the hunt, and that's something that must have been nerve-wracking for United States State Department officials. Now, the final round of games was played at the same time in three different stadiums in Doha. This was on October 28, 1993, and what happened was simply incredible. 
To qualify, South Korea needed to beat North Korea by at least two goals. South Korea also needed to hope that Japan somehow failed to beat Iraq. Iran, meanwhile, had to beat Saudi Arabia to stand any chance of qualification. And Iraq, of course, would have to beat Japan if it would stand a chance. Miura scored for Japan once again, sending Japan's fans into a frenzy. A win would guarantee Japan a spot in the cup. Saudi Arabia struck first, thanks to Sami Al-Jaber. This one by Fahad Al-Mehalel put Saudi Arabia up by two goals. But then Mehdi Fononina Zed got one back for Iran right before the end of the first half. South Korea and North Korea, meanwhile, had played a really drab first half of football and were still scoreless. Time was running out on the South Koreans. That was the state of things at the half, as this Japanese broadcast shows. Less than five minutes later, Iraq scored, but it was ruled offside. Now, there was no replay on the broadcast, so we're going to have to make our own. Personally, I'm having a real hard time seeing how he was offside. Meanwhile, Go Jong-un scored for South Korea, putting them up 1-0 over North Korea. And it was Mansour al Musa scoring for Saudi Arabia, putting them up 3-1. It was Fononi Nazed answering four minutes later, however, which cut the Saudi lead to 3-2 in a game that was absolutely wild. And while all of this was going on, Japan was under a huge amount of pressure. This was an excellent play by Japan's keeper. In the end, though, it was Iraq's magician, Ahmed Rahdi, who managed to break through for the equalizer. Okay, at this point, Japan was drawing 1-1 with Iraq. South Korea had a one-goal lead, which meant that Japan and South Korea were tied on goal differential. Japan, however, had the head-to-head -head victory as a tiebreaker. The Saudis, meanwhile, were still likely to qualify, though they only had that slim one-goal advantage. Yeah, this one literally went down to the last final minutes. Hamza Idris Falatha scored for Saudi Arabia to put them up 4-2. That effectively ended any chance that Iran had of catching them and practically ensured Saudi Arabia would go to its first World Cup. Meanwhile, Hwang Son Hong capped off an incredible South Korean counter-attack to get that important two-goal advantage against North Korea. This goal gave South Korea the advantage in goal differential should Japan wind up drawing with Iraq. But then Nakayama Masashi scored for Japan. That put Japan up 2-1 against Iraq. The Japanese fans were delirious, as it seemed certain that Japan would win. Hasok Ju scored South Korea's third goal that erased any doubt that the North Koreans were going to come back. And the battle of the Koreas ended with that 3-0 score, but you can see the disappointment on the face of the South Korean players since they realized that Japan was still winning. Javad Manafi scored for Iran literally on the last kick of that game, making the final score of that wild classic 4-3. Saudi Arabia were through. Japan, meanwhile, had multiple chances to add an insurance goal. Nobody was on the end of this cross. This was a huge chance that went wasted. Iraq almost equalized here, forcing a good save from the Japanese keeper. Seconds later, nobody was on the other end of this cross for Japan either. This one was another late wasted opportunity. Japan tried to run the clock out at the very end. This late Iraq chance missed and forced a corner in the very last second. And then it happened. Jafar Omran scored the equalizer at the very last second. That goal was scored seconds after the Korean game ended. The players went from frustration to jubilation in front of everybody as they realized they had qualified based on that goal differential. The Japanese players, meanwhile, were absolutely distraught. What had seemed a sure thing turned into utter failure in the blink of an eye. Well, and that's the way that it goes. 
Now, you'll remember that Saudi Arabia made it as far as the round of 16 during the 1994 World Cup. I mean, they really were a good squad. Japan, meanwhile, well, Japan did manage to qualify in 1998, though it was with a completely new side and a new manager. Japan also has qualified for every single World Cup after that. But, of course, that's all another story for another day.